Welcome to the second developmental session in our series, Conversation Analysis and Healthcare Interactions. Today, we'll be taking a closer look at the methodology of CA. Just before we get started, here are the two articles that we are using for today's session. Now, today, we are going to look at some of the practices involved in doing CA. We'll take a look at some basic CA methods and concepts. We'll also take a look at some examples of building collections in healthcare settings. From there, we'll have a discussion round to address two key questions for our session. During these rounds, you'll all get the opportunity to contribute thoughts ideas and questions. As a reminder, while all contributions are encouraged and welcome, they are entirely voluntary. Skipping your turn is always a valid choice. And don't forget, having your PDFs open just now will be helpful. So, just to recap what we covered in the last session. We looked at CA and its application to healthcare interactions. We examined the practice of option listing for treatment choices in a seizure clinic. We discussed the differences in turn design for option listing, and we discussed how different option listing strategies led to different sequential outcomes. For today, we're going to look more closely at the process of doing conversation analysis. The procedure for doing CA is intended to be inductive. That is to say, the analysis is informed by your data. This process is often described as unmotivated looking. However, it's worth making it clear at this stage that no line of inquiry can be entirely inductive. Nevertheless, it is possible to proceed with as few prior assumptions as possible. Doing this can allow you to notice and then identify interesting phenomena and more importantly, the sequential boundaries of these phenomena. That is to say, where they begin and where they end. And this is rather tricky in itself. A common question you will hear if you attend a data session is what came before the sequence or what happened just after it. Once identified, you can start to formally describe what you've noticed. After this, you'll want to look to see if it happens again. From there, you can start to build a collection and analyze the cases in your collection. However, it is critically important to remember that the analysis of a collection should never be performed at the expense of the details and complexities of each case in your collection. Some amazing CA work has been the result of what's called a single case analysis, and we will look at those later in our series. So, these are the basic procedures for doing CA. Next, we're going to look at what we, as conversation analysts, are actually studying. As obvious as it may seem, we are studying interactions. To elaborate upon this, we are not in the main studying participants. A key principle of CA is that meaning does not reside within individuals and is not fixed by the words they use. Instead, CA attends to socially organized practices and the actions they implement during interactions. This has been described as the greasy parts of the machinery or the mechanisms of interaction. In short, we are studying social practices that implement social actions. We are interested and how these actions are formulated and how they are received. Which leads us to a further question. What is a practice? 
Compared to actions such as asking, requesting and informing, the concept of a practice is a bit more tricky. As John Heritage describes it, practices can be considered as features of a turn or sequence. These are distinct in their presentation. Some may stand out, others are much more subtle. These practices will occupy a specific location within a turn or sequence, and they will matter. That is to say, they will have consequences for what happens next. And these practices needn't be complicated. A practice could be a, si a single utterance. There's a body of research on tiny words that matter, such as O oh and um. So the next thing to consider is how do we identify practices? Practices can be considered as the mechanisms in conversation that formulate actions, asking, telling, informing, responding, and so on. However, these practices can only be effective if they can be recognized by the recipient. Likewise, recipients must have practices that they can use to demonstrate their understanding, to check that their understanding is correct, or to solve problems that can arise during interactions. These are important resources for interaction, but they're also important resources for doing CA. They provide a powerful tool in both the process of doing CA as well as helping to validate analytical claims. This is known as the next turn proof of procedure, and that is to say, what comes next. This gives you a good indication of how a recipient received the prior turn. Once you've identified a practice, the next step in the process is to find your evidence. As you'll probably have gathered, the evidence used to construct an analysis is in the data, and your data is your audio and your video, not your transcripts. It's in the data that you can see how an action was formulated from what is said and how it is said. It's in the responses or lack of response that you can see how a recipient oriented to this action. And this is a key element of CA. Your analysis is beholden to these micro details of each turn identifying initiations, checks for understanding, responses, and so on. It's this turn-by-turn -turn microanalysis that is the core of CA. The next turn proof of procedure is what allows for validity checks to be performed on analytic claims. So, with that, we come to another question. What happens when people don't do what you expect them to do. There is an old phrase in English that has its origins in law, the exception that proves the rule. And to a certain extent, this applies in conversation analysis. This is important because people do not always act in ways that might be expected. Now this might be considered as a problem, but it turns out these exceptions are incredibly useful for identifying the regularities of social interactions. Some of the most powerful analyses are supported by exceptional or deviant cases. This is because it's in these exceptional sequences that we can see how participants orient to the normative expectations, or in other words, what was meant to happen. A simple example of this uh, might be a question and response sequence. If you ask a question, it's reasonable to expect some form of response. This is a form of adjacency pair. The question is your initiating first pair part. The response is a conditionally relevant second pair part. So for example, an initiating question might be one that requests information. In this, the response can do multiple things. It can provide the information in alignment with the request. 
or the recipient may fail to provide the information while simultaneously acknowledging their normative obligation to do so. So, for example, they might say, sorry, I don't know. They may not respond at all, after which the person asking may pursue a response or make inferences as to why a response was not forthcoming. This could include something like asking the question again or a further pursuit for a response, such as, did you not hear me? So, we are studying interactions, identifying practices and building evidence. As part of the process, we have tools and techniques to identify these regular social practices and then build a collection. We have turn design, the building blocks of turns. We have the highly ordered process of taking turns at talk, also known as turn taking. And subsequently, we have the orderliness of how action sequences are organized. There is quite literally order at all points of interaction. In this, you can discern the regular patterns of social interaction. And you can also identify how alternative practices can accomplish alternative actions, which results in different consequences. And I think it's worth mentioning at this point that in CA, there's plenty of work still to be done. Work in CA continuously brings new insight. For example, professors Clayman and Raymond recently published work on the use of you know in everyday interactions. In finding the regularities of social interaction, we need to then consider the relationship between certain practices and the actions they implement during interactions. To do this, we need to consider both the composition and location of a practice, that is to say, what and where. A good example of this is the well preface, that is, saying well at the beginning of a turn as a social practice. Using it at the start of a responding turn can project an incoming turn that's not in alignment with the prior turn. For example, if someone were to ask, does this outfit suit me? And the other person were to start with, well, it's fairly easy to see where this response is going and it's probably not going to be positive. However, in an initiating turn, this preface can project a move to a topic transition, to close a topic, or to close an interaction. For example, well, I better get going is a very common move to closing a telephone call in English. And interestingly, there is cross-language evidence for this practice. John Heritage and Chase Raymond have done work on this practice in English and Spanish, respectively. So, in using this process, we can offer an analysis of how practices map to actions and how they shape interactions. Well, yes and no. At this point, I do want to make it clear that CA does not offer an if this then that recipe of relationships between practices and actions. CA does not constrain actions through concepts such as grammar, syntax and morphology. For example, questions can be asked in a declarative format. Entire turns at talk can be accomplished with a single word or utterance. The utterance hello can do so many things. This is why the most fundamental question in CA is not why that, but why that now? So, we've considered turn design, turn taking, sequential organisation and the relationship between practice and actions. In this, we can say that certain practices and actions are relatively stable across multiple settings. However, there will be practices that are more deeply embedded within a particular situation 
and are only recognizable with due consideration to these specifics. This includes specifics of culture, relationships, social or institutional setting, and more immediately, the sequential position of an exchange. If you think about how good friends might interact across different settings, how they can draw upon shared assumptions, unspoken shared knowledge that they each possess of each other, things like inside jokes. These specifics can, however, be discerned by what is said and how it is said and when it is said. These ethnographic considerations will always be important and should never be neglected, as they often have implications for the interactions that you're going to observe. In short, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between a practice and an action. The situation also matters. So, now we have some idea of what we're looking for. The next question is, where do you begin? That is to say, how do you go about actually doing CA? One of the first ways of identifying interesting phenomena may seem counterintuitive. That is to say, you look to previous studies to find out where interesting things might be happening. For example, the transition spaces, the places where there's an opportunity for a change in speaker. How do turns end? How do the next turns begin? What happens in between? You can also look at how interactions start or how they end. There's a lot of work on closing calls and closing interactions. For example, John Heritage's work on closing clinical encounters offers alternatives that might help to reduce unmet clinical needs. You also might consider what hasn't been said. That is to say, where nothing is said at a point where you would expect something. Marin Turin's paper, Seeing Silenced Agendas, offers a great analysis of the unsaid. At its most basic, you observe, notice something, describe it, see if it happens again. After this, you build a collection. Then, once built, see if you can offer a description and explanation of what you've observed and then go on to show why it matters. As an example, say we wanted to find out what happens at the start of a telephone call. Here's an example from the opening of a phone call. Now this would be considered an unusual way to start a call. The excerpt starts with the caller, Emma, greeting her sister, Lottie. Lottie does not reciprocate. She gets straight to business. Well, where have you been? And here you can see the work being done on line two as the turn starts with a well preface. This well preface brings with it a turn that is not in alignment with the greeting on line one, which is morning. So the practice of interest here is in line two, some kind of information request that follows a greeting. So for this practice, we would ask, why that now? Now, if we compare the previous call opening to this one, the difference is striking. What we have here is very much a typical opening to a phone call at least typical in the absence of specific caller display information. Hello? Hi. 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 What we have here is a very ordinary exchange. After the telephone rings, which we couldn't hear in the clip, hello is the response to a summons on line two. Then there's an exchange of greetings on lines three and four, and you can see it happens very quickly, one turn after the other. Then there's an exchange of how are you's. These are on lines five and six. 
Finally, the sequence closes with an affirmative good, which enables the conversation to progress to a new topic. So, how can we be sure of our observations? Sticking with these two examples, our next step is to think about the practices we have observed. You'd start by building a collection of call openings. You would attend to the turns that comprise these openings, the evident practices and their actions. You would likely notice a regular occurrence of an exchange of how are you's in the opening parts of a telephone call. Then you might want to consider what happens when how are you's are absent. Then you can build a collection of cases that don't feature the exchange of how are you's. In our example, where have you been can be seen as more than an information request. This is more of an accusation or a complaint. And this can be further demonstrated when looking at what comes later in the sequence. I was down there over Memorial Day and you weren't there. Then you can work through your collection to find similarities for this practice of bypassing these how are you's. Now, in the context of healthcare interactions, there's a good body of previous research that can serve as a useful starting point. As institutionalized interactions, healthcare encounters tend to comprise a series of interrelated stages. Examples of these stages include the physical exam, delivery of diagnosis, and offering treatment choices. In healthcare interactions, CA can offer a comparative analysis. This can include alternative turn designs and practices. This can allow for an analysis of alternative actions and alternative consequences. This excerpt highlights the immediate consequences of alternative turn designs with an opening of a single consultation. After an exchange of greetings, which you can see on lines two and three, the doctor asks on line four, how are you doing? On line five, the patient initiates an overlap with the final part of the doctor's question with fine. After the smallest of gaps, the doctor then reformulates the question on line seven with how are you feeling? With an apparent emphasis on feel. On line eight, the patient once again initiates in overlap with the end of the doctor's turn, this time responding with much better. So what's the difference? As we noted, different turn designs can relate to different actions. In this respect, how are you doing is typically received as a social query. On the other hand, how are you feeling is typically received as a biomedical query, specifically within the context of the healthcare encounter. The differences are evident from the responses that each turn design receives. Fine versus much better. So in looking at consultation openings, you can build a collection, examine alternative practices, the actions they implement, and the consequences they have. This can include exceptions. For example, what happens when patients resist a how are you type query? As turn designs, practices, and actions unfold in alternative ways, so do the consequences. The work on online commentary is a good example of how talk during one sequence can have implications for another. Online commentary usually takes place during a physical exam, where the doctor produces what could be described as an in-the-moment description and an evaluation. Interestingly, 
patients rarely respond to this commentary. This online commentary, however, typically comes before what could be described as a no problem diagnosis. And more often than not, this diagnosis is seen as being acceptable to the patient. However, without this online commentary, patients tend to resist a no problem diagnosis. Therefore, we can argue that the use of online commentary during the physical exam has sequential implications. This can be established through the analytical process. Observe, notice something, see if it happens again, build a collection and look for relationships. So, to summarize, everyday social practices are used intuitively in clinical settings. The use of alternative practices can have alternative consequences, which can have important implications for the consultation. These implications include the extent to which patients are able to participate in the conversation. They also include the extent to which patients engage in the treatment decision-making process and even the choice of treatments. More broadly, these alternatives can relate to outcomes such as satisfaction with the encounter or satisfaction with the treatment decision. And with that, here are the two questions we will address at our discussion session. Thanks for watching.